Welcome to another edition of the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame's Hall Call interview series. I am Will Driscoll, the executive director here at the Hall of Fame. And as always, I'm happy to bring you our content platform highlighting topical issues or connections with, uh, with sports in Virginia. Before we get started, as always, I'd like to thank our sponsors who you see over my shoulder. We wouldn't be able to do Hall Call or any of our programs, events, and initiatives without them. So thank you to all of our sponsors. But well, we are just over a week away from another kickoff to another NFL season with the defending champion, Super Bowl champion, Kansas City Chiefs. I believe that's kind of deja vu at this point. Uh, they're hosting the Baltimore Ravens next Thursday on Thursday Night Football to begin another season all the way to the Super Bowl, culminating in February of 2025. But of course... As we've done every year since Hall Call kicked off in 2019, we're not just getting you ready for football season, we're getting re you ready for fantasy football season. And today, as we have been each year since 2019, we are joined by senior fantasy writer for The Athletic, Jake Seeley, who is based right here in Virginia Beach. He's an industry leader and award winner with his picks and rankings in both fantasy football and baseball, and I'm hoping some of what we talk today will carry over into your drafts leading up to the kickoff of the NFL season next Thursday. So, Jake, I know it's a busy time of year, but thank you as always for joining us. No, of course. I always love doing this. I can't believe six years already. It feels like just like a year yes. or two ago I met you. Uh, I believe this is episode 93 in Hall Call. So we've done this long form interview series for the last six years. And so we're wow. approaching 100. Uh, we couldn't get you to be 100, but we're, we're always thankful that you're here for year six of fantasy football talk. And so let's just jump right into it. I know sometimes we kind of go through trends and everything, but I do kind of want to hear from you what are the experts seeing as trends in their drafts and how is that matching up or going against what you're seeing in say the, the, the common drafts, the average drafts. So the biggest difference between, I would say I, I, experts, I hate, I hate that term, the, the, our fanalists <laughs> that we are. Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the biggest difference I would say continues just to be the quarterback position, uh, whether or not, you know, we started, I say we, the industry starts making a comment about that. If you want to go after the top guys, Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts and the like, uh, you know, we could see doing it in around three or four. But it's funny, as soon as our drafts happen, they don't they don't have they don't they don't come off the board at that point. It's usually not till round five or six, because it's it's basically what I'll tell everybody when they're drafting at home is, you know, your league better than I do. And so, you know, when you say, well, I'm trying to hope that this guy is here at blank or should I keep this guy? Because, you know, your draft, you know, your league, unless you just went on Yahoo or somewhere random like that and joined 11 random other people. But generally, quarterbacks go a lot earlier in home leagues, uh, mostly because the points scored, everybody's excited to get a quarterback. But as the industry knows, if you're in a standard 12 or even 10 team league, a lot of quarterbacks are going to be on the wire. Uh, CJ Stroud in a lot of leagues wasn't even drafted last year, and he ended up being a top five quarterback. And we usually see one or two QB ones that being a top 10 or top 12 quarterback that are off waivers two or possibly three a year that that's happened. So that's why uh, the other trend that actually is mimic that I will say is happening in industry and in home leagues or general population, whatever you want to call it uh, is <laughs> why receivers go. Yeah, Jen, Jen Pop. It's, 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 I feel like I'm talking down. Uh, it, it's wide receivers going early because it is a passing league, although it's funny. I did a study over at The Athletic and people are like, it's passing more than it's ever been. It's actually passing more than it's ever been starting 10 years ago. The increase really hasn't gone up that much over the last five, six years. It's been a one to two percent jump which is kind of insignificant. But over the last decade, it's still, it's a pass happy league. And because of that, uh, wide receivers populate the first two rounds a lot more than they ever have before. I mean, you remember 10, 15, even 20 years ago, it was running backs nonstop, but we don't see those running backs who get 20 carries, 20 touches, 25 touches a game anymore. It's just two or three guys we could probably name, Jonathan Taylor, Saquon Barkley, and you probably can count them on one hand. So because of that, and because it's passing more than it has been 20 years ago, uh, wide receivers do do fall into the first two rounds a lot more than they used to. I'd say it used to be 70-30 running backs. It's probably 70-30 wide receivers now at this point. Yeah, and, and I saw that in, in one of the leagues that I'm in. Uh, we had our draft earlier this week, and that was definitely the trend. You know, th this may be more of a football question as opposed to a fantasy football question, but 
you know, we saw the explosion of offense over the last decade. And like you said, it really started about 10 years ago. But now the defenses are catching back up. So you're not seeing the, the 38 to 35 games. You're, you're getting back to that 24, 21, yeah. that 20 to 17 game. How is that affecting how you all do your rankings now that you're seeing that the defenses, they took their time, but now they're really loading up on top end cornerbacks, top end safeties, linebackers that can move back and forth. Again, it's a football question, not fantasy football, but no, is that affecting your rankings and how you're looking at wide receivers versus maybe the running back position? I, I feel like I feel like Will read my column this all season. It's like one of my favorite ones, and it that didn't get as much attention as rankings get. But it was one that I spent a lot of time on. That's probably been one of my favorites so far. It was two trends in the NFL and how to exploit them in fantasy football. So for your point, and this is where I found out that passing isn't up as much as people might think. Over the last five years, zone defense has skyrocketed, and we're talking about from about a fifty percent rate five years ago to almost eighty percent last year and zone defense on top of the fact of running three corners slash safeties because a lot of times that third corner is safety slash corner but anyway uh, having a lot more out there than the linebackers uh, only two linebackers a lot of teams will run one linebacker because of the passing they're trying to stay over top and like i, I don't want to go like too far down the like the word rabbit hole so like, like basically like think of like an umbrella like you know you just kind of like they try to stay over top and keep the receivers in front of them well you don't want to just give them all that space so you kind of have zone like kind of paying attention to when the receiver enters their area and all that being said so in that article the other part of that is the offense tries to you know counteract that because it's you know it's, it's a back and forth all the way as the pendulum keeps swinging back and forth like one does one thing the other does another and the increase in pre-snap motion for the offenses is trying to offset that because you're trying to get a read on if they're in man coverage, you know, you have one guy you need to focus on or if they're on zone, because a lot of times they'll shift if there's motion and you can kind of get the quarterbacks can kind of get that read. But at the same time, that pre-snap motion lets wide receivers get open a lot easier. I mean, you've seen it a lot of times with the Tyreek Hill running across and then all of a sudden he takes off and nobody can catch up with him because he's already in motion. Um, so there's, there's that's the two things last year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if you look at that chart, he destroys zone defenses and he's amazing in pre-snap motion. So in fantasy, the reason I wrote this article is because you start looking for wide receivers who are really good against zone coverage. And you look at offenses uh, that are running a lot of pre-snap motion. And so your point, it, it is an NFL question, but in fantasy, we need to figure out what, if this is a trend that is worth going down the road in fantasy. There's been a lot of trends that I've gone down and spent a month on. And then I get towards the end. I was like, well, that ended up being fruitless. That There's like really nothing here, but this was actionable. So if anybody wants to read it again, it was a labor of love, so to speak. I love that article. And the biggest, I'll give you one more thing too, on a coaching standpoint, Kellen Moore is now the offensive coordinator for the Eagles runs a ton of pre-snap motion. So if you're excited and hoping that Jalen Hurts has a bounce back season, cause he kind of tailed off at the end of last year, I would be in on the Eagles offense. Well, you you reference it, and I'll say it again for the people who watch and the people who listen in podcast form, that there's tons of articles and information and resources on the Athletic Fantasy website. So be sure to get to that before you have your draft. Uh, we have I know that some drafts go up to literally the day before the season yeah. kicks off, so you still have some time. Um, you mentioned Jalen Hurts, and and one thing that kind of stuck out to me this year, especially looking at the quarterback rankings, is that Josh Allen is is number one. And I've known that Josh Allen has always been a valued a valued fantasy quarterback because of his ability to run. But what put him at the top of the rankings this year for you? It continues to be the fact that so uh, for fantasy, running is more valuable. Uh, you, this is why Jaden Daniels, which Commanders fans will love to hear, is actually inside my top 10 as a rookie uh, because for the default settings for everybody out there that might be new to fantasy it's one point for 10 rushing yards but for passing it's one for 25 so mm -hmm. if a quarterback runs for 10 he's already made up the points of having to throw an entire quarter of 100 yards so with josh allen you get a couple hundred yards you get five six seven maybe even 800 yards on the off season probably not going to happen but on top of the five or six hundred yards you get seven or eight rushing touchdowns now jalen hurts is in that same rushing world with 10 plus rushing touchdowns lamar jackson's a little bit more towards the 900 rushing yards with only three or four and those are both great but the difference is is josh allen is also throwing for over 4,000 yards is also throwing 30 touchdowns a season where jalen hurts and lamar jackson 
they're in the 3,000 range, throwing the low 20s, maybe mid 20s for passing touchdowns. This is why I say get back into Jalen Hurts. And if Jalen Hurts ended up being the number one quarterback this year, it wouldn't surprise me given what Josh Allen has lost in Stefan Diggs. And now they're trying to replace him and see who's going to step up. It's a questionable wide receiver room as of right now. So the projections just have him slightly in front. And if I'm drafting number one for if, Put it this way, if I was the first person to take a quarterback in round three or four, as we talked about, um, and not the first round, I would actually kind of see myself maybe differentiating, not taking only Josh Allen, just Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, because I don't know if this is a question you have later or if it's in here, but I will say is I draft with tiers. So if you go to The Athletic and you see my rankings, there's tiers. And for me, tiers is these players are all basically the same for different reasons, but they're all the same value. So... I never want to be the first person to start the next tier. Like you don't want to be the person who takes the first player out of 10 where everybody else is kind of getting the same value as you do. So for quarterback, I do have Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, Lamar Jackson, all in one tier together with Patrick Mahomes, obviously, but they're all in one tier. Like if you wanted to wait and take the last one of the group, that's fine. Um, And that's why I do tiers is because they are super close. So you don't want to be the first guy to take the top of the tier, but you being the last one to finish off that tier is all right. Probably. Yeah. It's probably a really good thing to get the last person. And it helps you make a decision too. So like if go back to my quarterback discussion, if you're sitting there in the third round and one of those four quarterbacks is there, but running backs already blown up a tier, two tiers, uh, wide receivers already gone through three tiers and you'd have to start both. And you're like, man, I could see all of those players still being there when the turn comes around in your draft. And, I, you know, why take the first, as you just said, when 12, 15 picks later, I'll still get the same value. Well, then I'll get the edge at quarterback instead of. So same thing, wide receiver is there's like one left, but there's a bunch of running backs. That's how you kind of can break those ties when you're like, oh, I don't know who to take right now. It's amazing when you look at kind of the the projected output versus, versus output from the actual output that they had last year, that it really is razor thin margins. And yeah. so sometimes you get people get so caught up in the name because it's the name they know, or maybe even the, the jersey that they wear just because some teams are more popular. But it, it's really getting down into those tiers. And you actually answered my question on tiers because I did want you to kind of explain that for the people who might be getting more and more into fantasy. But staying on that same topic about tiers, who who are is a player or a couple players that really jumped up from they historically for you had been tier two, tier three, and now they're firmly entrenched in in tier one could be at any position. Uh, So tier one, I would say, well, (laughs) I'll say tier two only because of this isn't like I'm looking through right now to give you an (laughs) example. It's like tier one is four quarterbacks running back is only Christian McCaffrey. So like there's there's nobody there with him. Uh, tier one for wide receiver is C.D. Lamb and Tyreek Hill. I already have a name in my mind. I just want to point this out why I'm going to tier two and not tier one. And then tight end is Kelsey and Laporta. I guess you could say Laporta after his rookie season. But the name that immediately came to mind when I was doing this uh, was actually at wide receiver is Amal Ron St. Brown. Now, like so tier two for wide receiver is still elite names. It's Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson, which we have know of actually – Justin Jefferson has been the wide receiver one. Um, But the difference, if you look at it, and this is why I do tiers, and you can differentiate if you want and say like, oh, I'm going to tweak your rankings a little bit, Jake. Please do. But CeeDee Lamb, Tyreek Hill, I know their quarterback situation. And I know what we've seen from their quarterback situation. Jamar Chase, injury risk for Joe Burrow. He hasn't been the one yet, so he's right there. Justin Jefferson has Sam Darnold. So now he goes from being potentially the one, like he's got a questionable quarterback. And that's just a little bit of a difference. But Amon Ross St. Brown climbs into this one where I had him at three last year, even after the season beforehand, just because Jared Goff, whatever you might think of him, like, this is funny because you say that like NFL versus fantasy, like NFL, like there's a lot of Lions fans even right now that are still like, yeah, Jared Goff is cool, but like, I think we could do better. Like if you said, you know, give me Patrick Holmes, you would do it 10 times out of 10. But I think there's other quarterbacks that they would still say, you know what, we'd make the swap. But for fantasy, Because especially indoors, he's throwing 300 yards a game, two or three touchdowns a game. And Amon Ross St. Brown is his go-to guy. Uh, He has been pushed up into this. I would still consider this an elite tier where even last year, I'm like, yeah, do I trust Jared Goff again? At at this point, you kind of have to. And the good thing um, kind of baked into this question here is Jared Goff, we know struggles outdoors. The good thing is he's only got three outdoor games. Heads up, though, if you do draft Jared Goff as your quarterback, the bad news is it's 
two of the last three games and it's outdoors to the bears and outdoors to the 49ers. So just have that plan for down there. Like when you make the playoffs, you might want to switch your quarterback. That's why we bring you here. That That's the information that we need, right? They're looking <laughs> ahead to semifinal or even the championships in your fantasy league. Jared Goff might not be the option to play. there. <laughs> they can get you, get you there. <laughs> he can get you there. That's right. You brought up an interesting point about Justin Jefferson and you kind of answered a question that I had that, how much value should we put in the fact that his quarterback is not Kirk Cousins anymore? And Kirk Cousins, regardless of what you think, did chuck it the ball up a lot. So for fantasy purposes, Kirk Cousins was a fun quarterback to follow, especially if he had a reliable receiver like Justin Jefferson. Now you don't have J.J. McCarthy, and that would have been a rookie, so questionable anyway. Now you're back to Sam Darnold. How should we view Justin Jefferson? Because he is in that probable first five picks of the draft, of every draft almost. Yeah, I think you just say we've seen him do it with Nick Mullins, which should be telling that, like, you know, Nick Mullins threw over 300 yards, I think, in three or four of his five starts at, towards the end of the year. Uh, but what it comes down to is over the course of a full season, there's still risk here. Like the biggest thing about these tiers to go back to, which is part of this question, too, is you're trying to find those little lines between players, um, especially once you get deeper into the drafts, which I'm sure we'll talk about is now you're looking for upside guys like and what could go right, what could go wrong with Justin Jefferson. We know now what could go wrong, even with J.J. McCarthy not in the mix. We were factoring, OK, J.J. potentially starts half the season, more or less, whatever it might be. But you have an inexperienced quarterback and you have Sam Darnold, who struggled at the end. NFL pretty much his entire career at this point and you say well that takes him out of that top tier but he's still so good Justin Jefferson's still so good that even when we saw Jamar Chase with Jake Browning for the Bengals last year replacing Joe Burrow is some of these offenses and talents fix that you know the offense for the Bengals Kevin O'Connell for the Vikings the head coach and his mind uh, offsets the risk where you know if you said hey let's look at the Giants Justin Jefferson and it's Daniel Jones already a major risk and then if he got hurt now you're down to Tommy DeVito you would have Justin Jefferson probably a whole tier down because of how bad that situation is and there's questions of the play calling with Brian Dable and what's going on over there conversely it's not as bad in this situation because they are so good if Justin Jefferson worst case scenario and he plays the full season we can always talk about risk of injuries but if he played the full season even with Sam Darnold I think it would be shocking if he still wasn't a top 10 wide receiver whereas you put him in another offense even like the Titans to think off the top of my head you'd be like oh you know what I could actually see him being as bad as 20. so it really comes down to knowing who the coach and the offense is and understanding like that can offset some of the concerns at quarterback Speaking of another, basically the the tier one of tier one players in Christian McCaffrey, he's most yeah. likely going one, maybe two in almost every draft. But that pace, that touchdown pace that he set last year, how sustainable is that? And where are you looking that if if that can't keep up, where can you still get the value in drafting Christian McCaffrey at, at one overall? So I actually don't have any concerns because Christian McCaffrey last year was a high workload, but it was kind of a higher workload in now and days running backs, kind of what we were talking about earlier in the show. Uh, really, Christian McCaffrey, they kept him in a range of making sure he was healthy and didn't get run into the ground. Also from just the wear and tear of the career and in season. So I think if you look at Kyle, or, yeah, Kyle Shanahan and this offense and what they've done and how he's managed his running backs, even before Christian McCaffrey, is that we always joke about. I was like, a Shanahan offense, we want the running back. Just tell us who your guy is, and we want him. Christian McCaffrey's on a whole nother level. So I'm not that concerned. Uh, I don't think I would go after, like, Jordan Mason is now the new backup because Elijah Mitchell is out for the year. Uh, Jordan Mason, though, where, uh, well, I'll say is the value of when people are looking for high-end backups, um, there's a few teams where you could say, okay, if the guy went down, I definitively want the one behind him. You want the guy on the Shanahan offense. Like to go back, to use my Giants example again, I used to be a Giants fan. So like you ever said, like I say used to be because I, I, they're like still off here on the side. Like it, it did the same thing with the Mets until ownership changes. Like I kind of put them like, hey, we used to be friends, but we're not anymore. I actually you're, look. You're I even to a this, reformed Commanders fan. Dan Snyder sucked the like See, oh you understand. And now the Snyder's gone. You can come back. My wife did the same thing. But before they even drafted CJ Stroud, you can go look at my history. Like I'm, I'm all, t all in on Texans coming on the bandwagon here. Um, but anyway, I'm saying this to say like when Saquon Barkley got hurt, it was like, well, who's behind him? Like we don't really care for fantasy because there's not the workload of Barkley and there's not the production, especially on a weaker offense. The difference with McCaffrey is, is if he were to get hurt, 
we know Shanahan's going to make somebody productive. So you want the next one up who had been Elijah Mitchell and that should be Jordan Mason. So if it's not McCaffrey also, and they pull off a little bit more of their touches from him, maybe they do. Maybe they even pull them off 10% more. Uh, the big question is, as of right now, which is shocking, we're still talking about, is Brandon Ayuk going to be on this team? If Brandon Ayuk is going to be on this team, I think he sees a little bit of the benefit because he was extremely productive. So is George Kittle on a low target share from last year they actually just over 100 targets for Ayuk and under 100 targets for George Kittle so if they say hey let's pull back McCaffrey a little bit pass a little bit more because people are so set defenses are so set to stop McCaffrey maybe we see even a better season for Brock Purdy who's con- continually underrated I mean when you're the last pick in the draft totally people don't want to believe <laughs> so I, I think for now with the third year in a row well because the first year it was nobody believed even that he did it in the middle of the season last year it was like well let's hold on it was only a half a year and now people are still like yeah but it's still Brock Purdy I think he needs to be in the conversation with like Jared Goff at this point yes yeah exactly he's got the weapons around him um you know you might trade him for a, a dozen other quarterbacks, but in that yes. system with that, with those weapons, he's probably got some value in fantasy. Um, you yep. know, we always talk about some, some rookies, some impact rookies that are potentially there. And the two, the two quarterbacks at the top of the draft, Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels, kind of two different styles. I think from a fantasy standpoint, you'd probably lean a little bit more towards Jaden Daniels if you're going to make a, a mid to late round pick. Um but who are the other rookies that we should be looking at in those mid to late rounds that could really make a valuable impact on, on your team? Yeah, real quickly on that, and for everybody out there, that goes back to the rushing for quarterbacks. Yeah. Like Jaden Daniels has, I'm not projecting him too, but he has a thousand yard rushing upside. Caleb Williams just won't run that much. Caleb Williams will probably run 300 yards. And that's a huge difference where everybody would take the talent of Caleb Williams over Daniels. But for fantasy, different world. Running back's a little tough this year because there wasn't a lot, and the best talent that we all assume when we were evaluating, we all assume the best talent is Jonathan Brooks, who's starting the year hurt, might have been playing in the few, first few weeks for the Carolina Panthers. Maybe by midseason, we're talking about him as a top 20 running back, but you have the whole Panther situation of like, okay, if we're completely out of it, as expected, come the middle of the season, do we just give him a few touches per game as we get him NFL ready for 2025? So that's the problem there. If you're talking about rookie running backs like Blake Corum behind Kyron Williams, again, an offense where if the lead goes down, we know what Sean McVay does for his running backs, similar to Shanahan. He's going to make them good. So if something were to happen to Kyron Williams, Blake Corum's in play. Uh, We just saw Marshawn Lloyd for the Packers has been banged up, but A.J. Dillon's out for the season. Uh, Lloyd is somebody to put in your mind for down the road, maybe later this year. At wide receiver, everybody knows Marvin Harrison. Like he's actually being drafted as a top 10, top 12 wide receiver. No, no under, no questions need to be asked there. The next two, I think the third, the third option that should be in the mix isn't. So what I'll say the next two were the next two off the board in the draft. It was Malik neighbors to the giants and Roma Dunze to the bears. Neighbors is great. And he's going to see a ton of targets, but to go back to the Justin Jefferson conversation, 120 targets from Daniel Jones versus 120 targets, even from Sam Darnold, I'll take, the Sam Darnold 120 targets. So neighbors is definitively going to be a top 35 wide receiver on talent alone. But I have concerns of that people are drafting him inside the top 20. And I think there's more concerns for that offense than there should be. Adunze is a different animal. You could argue he's the best pure talent, even better than DJ Moore, but he's going in as the third option, which we saw Jackson Smith and Jigba last year get drafted by the Seahawks. And for everybody that doesn't even know this, He was wide receiver 64 in points per game. I do think Adunze will be better than that, but there's a problem when you come in as a rookie and you're the third option. So the third name I'm going to say is the one that I think deserves a lot more respect, and it's Brian Thomas for the Jaguars. Uh, I think he kind of got a little bit overlooked because of this NFL's draft. Wide receivers were so good that most years Thomas would have been one of the first two. Look at what he just did at LSU with Jaden Daniels. And I think he steps into the Calvin Ridley role and puts up Calvin Ridley numbers, which was a top 25 wide receiver. If I'm drafting just purely for 2024, he would be my third rookie wide receiver after neighbors. And it would be very close. I would take him before I took a Dunze. Definitely some massive uh, impact potential with some of those names that you just mentioned, uh, especially at the wide receiver position, kind of going back to what we've talked about this year and and in years past. Um, You know, I was in one of, uh, I was in a draft recently and two names on the same team that really surprised me at kind of how they're viewed now versus how they've been viewed in the past couple of years 
are Bijan Robinson and Kyle Pitts down in Atlanta. They, I mean, obviously Kyle Pitts came out with all the fanfare of becoming, you know, basically the next Kelsey or Gronk. He was a wide receiver at the tight end position. Robinson was an impact back, but I'm seeing them drop lower this year for for output reasons. Is that what you all are seeing in your drafts as well? Uh, lower than they were last year, but higher than where they finished, so to speak, because uh, you can include Drake London in this too, the wide receiver, immensely talented wide receiver who hasn't hit yet. But this is one of those situations where you talk about, I mean, just look at last year's Falcons and that quarterback situation. And as much as we love the hometown hero and Taylor Heineke, uh, there's struggles in the NFL. Like, we'll be honest about the talents. Like, you know, he's great and it's fun to watch and Actually, he's kind of exciting for fantasy at times, but there's a limit to his game. Not everybody can be the best in the like in anything, and that's why we have the best of the best in Hall of Fames, and then we have others that aren't. So <laughs> I try to be nice. I love Heineke. Um, I actually have a Heineke jersey somewhere from ODU. I can't even find it somewhere. Um, but anyway, the, the problem with that was not just the quarterback situation with Ritter and Heineke. It was also Arthur Smith. And Arthur Smith, as fantasy people will know, is one of the, probably the most hated people in fantasy because of what he does to his offense. This is just who, this is why I go back to the Kevin O'Connell thing well, where like not fans should be thrilled, right? Oh, oh a Pittsburgh Steelers fans should be scared. <laughs> like, and I'll, I'll tie that in too. So uh, with Kevin O'Connell, Sean McVay and those Shanahan's and those names, it's like, okay, we know for fantasy for offenses, it's going to be good. And not every offense needs to be that. And not every offense will be that in the NFL to win Super Bowls. Heck, the Chiefs offense isn't Shanahan and McVay and all these. Uh, but it's a little bit different. It's still really good because you have Patrick Mahomes. The problem with Arthur Smith is multi-leveled. He likes to use multiple running backs. You have Bijan Robinson, who was drafted as a top 10 running back, which nobody drafts running backs inside the top 10 in the NFL anymore. And they draft him and then don't use him all the time. They bring in Tyler Algier, which Tyler Algier is a nice talent, but he's not Bijan Robinson. Like that goes back to like the whole Hall of Fame conversation. So you had that being frustrating. People were taking Bijan as the second or third running back, and then he wasn't. He was still RB one, top ten, top twelve, but he wasn't what people wanted him to be. Drake London was taken as a wide receiver too, inside the top twenty to twenty four wide receivers. Didn't come close because they ran the ball so much, and then the offense was hurt by Smith's play calling and the quarterback play. And then Pitts, probably even worse than Bijan, was sharing time with Jonu Smith, who's now on the Dolphins. When you have, as you mentioned, somebody who had a historic rookie season in yards, mm -hmm. and you're sharing this talent with somebody who's a fine tight end, but he's not hes not Kyle Pitts. So he's, they're all gone. Like in the fact of like, they're all gone from the concerns of last year because Arthur Smith is gone. And now you have what you like you see with the new Raheem Morris staff is a better coaching situation and what he brought in with the offensive coordinator. So you say, okay, Drake London is going to get peppered by Kirk Cousins, huge quarterback upgrade. Kyle Pitts should stay on the field and get peppered by Kirk Cousins, huge upgrade. And hopefully you stop get Bijan Robinson pulled out of the goal line or only getting five touches one week because that nonsense is out the window. Conversely for the Steelers, all those concerns, now go to your team. Uh, I think George Pickens is okay. Pickens, well, yeah, <laughs> that's the funny thing. It's like, I think George Pickens is okay because Russell Wilson, we have faith in him. But what we've already seen, here's a perfect example of this coaching situation. What we've already seen in the preseason is Pat Fryermuth is only running 60% of the snaps with the first team passing offense. He's coming off the field for Darnell Washington, which that's exactly what Arthur Smith did with Kyle Pitts. And now you have Fryermuth, So maybe your sleeper tight end Fryermuth should be kind of cast aside and look for somebody else. Najee Harris has no Jalen Warren right now because Warren's banged up. But what happened in that last preseason game with the first team offense? I'm not sure if anybody saw, but Najee Harris didn't get all the touches. They brought in Cordell Patterson to take the Jalen Warren touches. So that whole backfield is going to be a headache. It, it, you, this is why the coaches actually matter for fantasy. You mentioned Fryermuth, and and I did want to touch on the tight end position uh, before we get out of here in a few minutes. But you know, Travis Kelsey is still, uh, believe it or not, listed as the number one overall tight end, and I think a lot of that has to do with still the uh, uh, the the influx or the uncertainty, I should say, around the wide receiver position in Kansas City. Like it, it, he's basically the safety blanket for Patrick yep. Mahomes, and as long as he's healthy, he's going to put up numbers. But this could just be me in my opinion, but looking at the tight end position on the surface, a few years ago, I felt like it was one of these where there was a lot of value late. Is that value still there? Or is it really, really just top heavy now with Kelsey Laporta? 
You know, it fun, it's funny. I'm I'm laughing in my mind because it's like every single year. So I know I see multiple people like, oh, tight ends back. Ooh, we have so many options at tight end. And then the middle of the season rolls around and like, man, there's only five good options because somebody's getting ruined like Kyle Pitts or somebody gets hurt or other things. But no, right I, I now, Zach Ertz, you know, 12 weeks. Was like, yeah, exactly. So, um, it's, so there's actually two answers I want to give here. One is one you didn't ask at all, but uh, I think there's t- there's nine tight ends I'd be comfortable with. But to answer your question is like, we've been having eight or nine that we've said we're being comfortable with for the past few years, but it's like that third tier. And to, again, to go back to tiers, the tier this year for me is Ingram, Kincaid, Kittle, and Ferguson for the Cowboys. That tier usually has two, if not all three out of four of them, not do anything you want him to do. Kyle Pitts was in that tier last year. Like that's the problem is like a lot of them end up missing. So you do end up down to like five or six good options. I do think it's better. I I wouldn't expect three out of those four to fail. I would be actually shocked if one of them did. And I say fails and be completely irrelevant in fantasy. Maybe they're not top eight, but they're still usable. Um, What I suggest for a lot of people because I want fantasy to be fun. You can play whatever way you want. I, you know, I'm banned kickers. You can see the t-shirt over there. It, like, I hate kickers. But if you want to play with three kickers, go ahead. Fantasy is supposed to be fun. So this is why I've pitched this for the past couple of years. If you're in a league and you have the tight end only position, I've pitched to make it a wide receiver slash tight end position where you can't put running backs in there because, you know, a lot of people would play or it's, you know, that's already a questionable position now we're in the days we are. But it just opens things up where buys hit and then all of a sudden like if you have laporta and pitts and ingram on buys now you're chasing okay i hope my tight end catches a touchdown this week so it kind of makes those decisions of do i play john smith or do i play like a gabe davis and it actually gives you just not only more options it's not making it easier it just kind of makes you add another level of strategy of like oh i really like this matchup people are kind of overlooking it and i think i could do this again you don't have to play this way but I I say this, I know you didn't ask it, but it's because the tight end position is really not what it was back in the days of Gronkowski, where there were six, seven great options, and then another handful of really good ones, where tight end five is scoring what tight end, you know, 15 was 10 years ago, and that's just the case. I think it's one of those things that you kind of have to look at it from the prism of there's 32 starting running backs and there's 32 starting tight ends the gap between the 32nd best running back and the 32nd best tight end is massive. Is that (laughs) that what I'm hearing? (laughs) Uh, Pretty much. Heck, you could do the 48th wide receiver and the 32nd tight end, and it's beyond massive. So it's it's just – it's not used in the way it was anymore. And part of that has to do with – we talked full circle on this, on the NFL adjusting and how it's a passing offense, and there aren't a lot of tight ends – who are out there running routes every single play. Part of it is the blocking. But because offenses aren't using I formation fullback running back, which you remember, like nobody runs that anymore. But part of that was the blocking. So now you have some of the tight ends blocking instead because you're running more three wide receivers. And that just limits their ability to run routes. To go back to the Bills with Kincaid, they're probably going to run 12, which for people out there, it's one, two, two tight ends. And with two tight ends, you have one of them usually blocking, one of them usually running routes, but it won't always be the same guy because you don't want to telegraph defenses what you're doing. So the concern for Kincaid is what if he's not always running routes and what if he's blocking? Uh, And then you have an issue where my tight end is now losing half his snaps to blocking. So he's only going to get 70 targets versus what we're hoping to be 90 or 100. So all these things come into play. So, I mean, but you said we could customize our league. So maybe if we do a paint block as a as a half point or a point you know maybe the tight end value goes up <laughs> you could do that too yeah pancake i like that i love pancakes well hey we uh we have just a few minutes left but i did want to i did want to go deep down in the draft now and for the for those people that have their 12 team leagues and you know 16 rounds you're always looking for that value in the late rounds or even post draft and you have a great article about the people that are not being drafted, but the people that are going to be immediately available in free agency. Who are some of the diamonds in the rough, if, if you will, that we should be able to find late in the draft or even following the draft? Can, can I self backpat on this one? I was shocked. I went back and looked at last year's. I, did, I do the same article every single year. I was yeah. shocked that half of them became fantasy irrelevant. Half. That, to, 
say like I, so, I, like, so I say that some of those examples. So let's yeah. let's talk about let's talk oh, about from last year from last examples. year. I'll, I'll pull it from like so Luke Musgrave at tight end was in there. Um, they see now you do it made me pull this off the top of my head and I'm going to like pull this article back up and like find it like I'm, I'm going here. and I'm going to say, let's see where look, I'm doing research live on here to find out who else it was because I know Darius Slayton, but I, I Darius Slayton comes to mind, but I'm like, yeah, nobody cared about. It. Oh, here we go. Sam Howell, as yep. you remember. Fantasy, he was a QB1 until the end of the year, admittedly. But we talked about that again, the schedule thing, which I brought up with Jared Goff. We, I say we, like the Chris Meany and I do a podcast together, uh, the All in Fantasy podcast. And we were like, watch out, the end of the year looks scary. So same thing. And we know he lost his job. But Jaden Reed was a wide receiver three. Josh Downs was a wide receiver three. Jake Ferguson was a top six tight end. Luke Musgrave was a tight end one as top 10, top 12. Ty Chandler ended up being a running back two at the end of the year because of injuries and how that played out. Those are just some of the ones from last year. So I'm not saying that like, haha, I know everything. It just is fun. It's fun when you're like, wow, I, I didn't realize it was that good last year. So I'll give a couple of wide receivers. The one I keep bringing up right now is because of talent, Jermaine Burton should have gone earlier in the draft. There's legitimate concerns about his coachability. Uh, we remember this. If everybody goes back, I don't know how old the audience is, but Percy Harvin, hometown hero, what was one of his issues? And this is part of the reason he kind of flamed out in the NFL is because he wasn't coachable. Like people got frustrated because he wouldn't listen. Insane talent. If anybody watched him at Lansdowne, you'll remember. I know you remember. Insane talent. Uh, but that happens with some players. I always bring up Marquise Lee when he got to the NFL. Similar thing. He figured things out four or five years down the road. But unfortunately, his career was already getting late at that point. So Jermaine Burton had a similar concern, has a similar concern. He's buried behind T. Higgins and Jamar Chase. But if anything were to happen to either one of them, he's going to step in to a Joe Burrow, Cincinnati Bengals offense, and immediately put up numbers. Another one just like him. And this is, again, these aren't guys that you should necessarily draft, but super deep, remember the name, maybe stash them. Uh, Jalen McMillan, if anybody watched the championship game with Washington, just knows how to find space. We talk about zone coverage. He knows how to exploit zone coverage. And now he's on the Buccaneers where Mike Evans is really getting up there in age. Chris Godwin's dealt with injuries. And if something were to happen to one of them, if you want somebody who can step into a messy offense that we're not super excited about, but could be the one or two Jalen Polk for the Patriots, especially if Drake may does end up becoming the quarterback, which maybe we'll find out today or at some point. Um, those are just some wide receiver names. I brought up Jordan Mason before, and uh, I'll give you one more. It, it, the Tyron Tracy for the Giants. If everybody remembers Antonio Gibson for our commanders here, uh, he's now with the Patriots. Similar profile, actually somebody who was a converted wide receiver to running back and has that passing game upside where, you know, if Devin Singletary struggles or if he even gets hurt. But if you notice, a lot of these are like struggles, hurt. These are ones to remember. These are guys that usually end up on waiver wire come week four or five, not necessarily right out of the gate. Yeah, it's it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It all starts That's with the, the biggest draft. thing. But some of those drafts go 16, 17 rounds, and then you have your 15 week season. So marathon, not a sprint. Remember those names, uh, whether it's at the top of the draft or at the bottom of the draft. There's always going to be names that are a surprise to you, but could potentially provide some value. And we're always happy to get your perspective, Jake, on where that value is and just your overall knowledge of the fantasy football conversation. And thank you again for joining us on this edition of the Hall Call Interview Series. I know it's a busy time of year for you, but we do appreciate your time. No, oh, I always love doing it. It's for six now. It's going seven years next year. I'm ready for it. And well, you'll have a hundred episodes by then. I'll miss out on it. No, don't worry. You'll be a big part of it. We'll do some big celebration. <laughs> Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. But for those who are watching and those who will listen, be sure to read Jake's content either prior to your draft or even after draft in season, Athletic Fantasy Sports. You can also follow him on Twitter at All In Kid, All In Kid, one word, tons of fantasy information, whether it's football, baseball, 365 days a year. I'd like to thank everyone who is going to watch this video or follow along with the Hall Call interview series and podcasts. As always, thank you to our sponsors you see over my shoulder. Be sure to stay up to date on all things Hall of Fame and Hall Call uh, by following us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. The Hall Call podcast is available on Apple, Spotify, or SoundCloud. Once again, I'm Will Driscoll with the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame. Whatever you do, participate, don't spectate, and we'll see you next time.